local main character Zep here. What the hell? I don't know if you know, but I know that Beyblades are shattering apart, and that's a no for me, dog. Across social media, I've been seeing pictures of broken bays at a rate I only see every time a new Beyblade series is released. Big shocker, the toys that hit each other tend to break before they work the kinks out. But this time, it seems different. Of course, you'd expect Burst's Victory Valkyrie to break with its aggressive shape supported by only a little bit of plastic. But Dran Sword is the same shape, just made out of metal. So why is it breaking in the same way? I mean, Metal Fight Bays also had a tendency to break depending on the mold, but most of them seem to have lasted to today. What makes the x bays want to die young? We have a material evaluation on our hands, and I've snuck into enough material science and engineering classes to maybe guess at an answer. That's not a joke. I thought it would be funny, and it was, and now I can do this investigation. All bits are righteous under God if they have good payoff. If we want to know why something's breaking, we have to know what something's breaking. x bays are made out of metal. So what's metal? Toys like this are usually die-cast, which means metal is poured into a mold. Replace those with synonymous jargon and you could say they're cast into a die. The type of metal optimal for this kind of application is usually some form of Zamac alloy, or if you prefer, Zamac alloy. Zamac stands for zinc, aluminum, magnesium, and copper, with Zamac standing for the same thing if you speak the language of that one country who makes the Euro games. It makes for a material that's incredibly easy to melt down and cast. That's great for production. While the tools and die are uber expensive, costing tens and thousands of dollars each, once you have them, you can mass produce parts in minutes, if not seconds. Zamic is cheap, and by using dies, you don't lose as much material as, say, machining, where you carve away a bunch of metal, time, and labor. Good for precision parts for an airplane, but not so much for a dinky toy you need a bunch of. Or cheap nuts, bolts, and tools. The wrench kind, not the mold kind, sorry. There's going to be a lot of jargon here. Zamic isn't just for Hot Wheels. It's hard, asterisk, and that's a good thing for hardware. M most of the time. Zamic can also be made more soft depending on the recipe and process used to make it. It's an incredibly versatile alloy. Okay, so we've determined that bays are made out of Zamic, a cheap metal that is easy to cast and usually decently hard when cooled. Okay, why is it breaking then? They're not using the hardest possible specification of Zamic and toys, but that's not the whole explanation. Let's talk about metal a bit more. Most metal is crystalline in structure. That's why bismuth and pyrite look like cubes. That's how their crystal structure stacks up. When we look really close at a metal cross-section, we can see this crystal makeup as distinct grains. The crystallization of metal usually isn't uniform. Crystal structures nucleate around different points all over an object all at once, creating separate grains with crystal structures grown in different directions. Wherever grains of different directions meet, they form a grain boundary. How metals behave is heavily dependent on grain structure. Big grains mean big bends. Bigger grains mean a more malleable crystal structure, and smaller ones mean the exact opposite. So even if a material is chemically the same, the way it's structured on a microscopic scale can give it subtle changes in performance. Since we're talking about a scale of atoms, stuff like heat and work can change how grains are arranged. Heat treatment does this by exciting the molecules with heat to make them jimmy into new positions, like aligning the crystal structures of the grain together. Work hardening rearranges the grain boundaries to make the metal harder through mechanical alignment. In simpler words, the grains get physically rearranged by work, and that makes the metal harder. And all of that still doesn't answer why hard things can break so easily. So let's break that down more easily. If a metal can easily deform what people with degrees, i.e. not me, call being ductile, the metal being hit or bent doesn't matter as much because the grains can simply move out of the way, resulting in dents and other deformations. Whether those be elastic deformations, which are temporary, or plastic deformations, which are permanent. Think about it like trying to bend taffy versus trying to bend a candy cane. The taffy is ductile, so it'll just bend. The candy cane is hard, so eventually, it'll do that. 
being hard and being brittle are very much kind of the same thing. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. To elaborate further, the reason why work hardens metal is because it squishes the grains into a thinner form factor. This means that the imperfections and little gaps in the metal's crystal structures, called dislocations, can't move around as easily, because while they can move within one grain of metal, they cannot hop from grain to grain. In ductile metals with big grains, the dislocations have room to move around so the metal can plastically deform a lot, but in these hardened metals, they can't move around that much without being stopped by the grain boundary, so hard metals can't deform as much. The reason why machines like airplanes have to get retired after a while is because ductile materials, like aluminum, get work hardened and easier to crack. And you don't want the wings on a plane just to randomly crack, no matter what Boeing would have you believe. So we give them some flex, and the action of flexing allows the work to harden the metal and it becomes a vicious cycle. So, are the hard hits of X hardening the metal of the bays, leading to breakage? Probably not. Work hardening is a bit more of an involved process than that. So what gives? It still has to deal with hard hits in the microscopic shape of the bay's metal, but it also has to deal with the bay's macroscopic shape. Or, as a normal person would say, the shape. Metal fight bays fought in a simple concave stadium where gravity brought them together for a few big hits before the bays ran out of that initial energy. And that's assuming an attack type was involved. Let's not ignore everyone's favorite pastime, a stall match between defense and stamina types. Blink, 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 blink. Riveting, the sound of champions. The shapes of the bays were also much more reined in and circular than other generations of Beyblade. Most attack wheels that weren't Flash, Blitz, or Very Ares used their shapes to scoop up and toss other bays, or generally grind away at them. The repeated hits just weren't as severe most of the time. The wheels that did break usually had stress concentrators, likely thin points that bore most of the stress from hits. They focused all of the energy of those hits without having the room to dissipate it. This fatigues metal, leading to tiny microscopic cracks forming in the stress concentrators. With each hit, new cracks, invisible to the naked eye, could form and propagate. Eventually, enough cracks would be created and grow until they could all connect and then boom, the original burst finish. When these hits happen leagues faster, powered up by gear ratios and wide flat tips, uh, the process is sped along a lot quicker, especially when the shapes are so aggressive on the bays. When looking across Beyblade history, the bays most likely to break apart are the ones with the incredibly aggressive form factors that concentrate all of their stress to just a few points. That's the MO for the Longinus line, all of Bakuten's shoot, and a lot of X bays. Even the defense and stamina types can ride the extreme line, letting them make some of the same aggressive hits as the attack types. It's not so much that Takara Tomi cheaped out on materials or anything, their designs are simply a little bit too extreme. Luckily, it's pretty easy to grab multiples of most blades, but it becomes tougher to grapple with metal fatigue on your more expensive bays or just having to buy a replacement after extensive use. As it turns out, spending money it costs a lot of money. At the end of the day, parts wear is an inevitable issue in any system where you have things hitting each other, and eventually you will have to replace and repair some of your parts. Other hobbies, like mini four-wheel drive, are built on this concept. It would be incredibly tough for Takara Tomi to affordably make bays that have the right places hardened and others kept ductile to make sure that the bay doesn't break. It would be like forging a sword every time they made a new bay. Also, I mean that in the most literal way possible. Swords are usually tempered in such a way that the blade edge is hard enough to cut things without deforming too much, and everything else is kept more ductile so it doesn't instantly shatter. Bays by nature are prone to fatigue because it's a game about slamming them together really, really hard. Takara Tomi will probably design bays to be less prone to breakage issues in the future, but realistically speaking, I think breakage issues are pretty rare in the Beyblade user base. Not everyone uses them as much as, say, competitive players or Beytubers. But you know, that's how the grain structure crumbles. At any time, the cracks could just choose to propagate faster randomly. So, eh. But it is better to be changed by love than to have never loved at all. 
So, uh, just live life. Every battle could be a bay's last, but at least it battled at all. Or you could lock your bays up and never use them like some kind of sicko. But I don't really care though, weigh your own sins. I'm not going to be the one judging you at the gates of the underworld. Better hope that Anubis or Saint Peter live the let it rip after lifestyle. I mean, it could always be worse. You could be flying a Boeing plane.